20 years ago, arcades and cable TV ruled. It was a time of darkness. It was a world of fear. It was the age of gargoyles. For those of you too young to remember, before the age of YouTube and social media, between the years of 1990 and 1997, there existed a two-hour television block called the Disney Afternoon, and during this block full of tales of ducks and gummy bear adventures, there was an odd show called Gargoyles, which told the story of a group of gargoyles from 10th century Scotland being transported to 20th century New York City, and their lives adapting to their new situation. When smug millennials of my age say cartoons were better in the 90s, Gargoyles is one of the series that tends to come out of our mouths when listing examples. And for quite good reason. Gargoyles came right at the time when animation focused towards kids was starting to be taken more seriously as an art form, with darker series like Batman the Animated Series and Gargoyles at the forefront. Characters grew and changed with each episode, the status quo was regularly shifting. This was a cartoon that dealt with complex issues that other shows of the time didn't, such as personal morality, gun safety, prejudice, revenge, and the importance of reading. But just as quickly as it came, Gargoyles seemed to vanish just as well from the public consciousness, mostly maintaining a cult status in corners of the internet, as well as people that go, oh hey Gargoyles, I love that show as a kid, when they hear it mentioned in conversation or see a related video recommended to them. So what happened? For a series that many claim to be a beloved part of their childhood, why did it go away as quickly as it did? Is this a case of nostalgia goggles blinding fans from the problems of an age-old series? Or was there something more to it all that wasn't seen? Well, throw off your backpack, grab a couple of fruit roll-ups, and sit back as I tell you a tale of success, failures, company mismanagement, and fan love. A tale of gargoyles. We are defenders of the night. We are gargoyles. To talk about Gargoyles proper though, we first have to talk about Disney, specifically the Disney Afternoon. Now while today we all view it as the mega corporation that will eventually own us all, in the 80s Disney had been in a major rut for a couple decades and was struggling to stay afloat, something that the then new CEO and future company villain Michael Eisner had hopes to turn around, as he had multiple strategies to revitalize Disney to its former glory. From building and expanding on its theme parks, multiple business acquisitions, and the resurgence of major critically and commercially successful animated films, Eisner was pursuing every possible avenue to make Disney a profitable company again. But of these plans to slowly take over the world, one of his more subtle approaches was to use TV as a way to market to a new generation of young fans with new characters mixed along with classics. A then radical move because Disney had avoided creating animation for television for over three decades. And thus in 1990, the Disney Afternoon was made, a block of cartoons created for Disney to be packaged and syndicated together for affiliate stations nationwide that would air between 3 and 5 p.m. to target the after school crowd, premiering series like Chippendale's Rescue Rangers, Tailspin, Darkwing Duck, and Goof Troop, all shows that attracted a lot of viewers. Though while the block was largely successful in its first couple of years, there started to be growing concerns by Disney TV animation founder Gary Crystal and one of the studio producers, Greg Weissman, that the Disney Afternoon had not enough diversity in its type of shows, especially from a visual standpoint, being exclusively dominated by bright colorful anthropomorphic animal cartoons, and that would eventually lead to fatigue in audiences that might want something a bit different. So Weissman started working on a pitch for a new cartoon something distinct from the rest of the shows Disney was producing at the time. Something with a rich backstory, strong character writing, and because it was the 90s, a bit of edge. This resulted in a series about gargoyles, magic beings that slept in stone during the day and came to life at night, set in modern day 1990s Manhattan to make it really stand out. Originally though, while what would eventually become gargoyles was fundamentally there, with detailed lore and a darker tone, the show at first had more of a comedic slant earlier in its development, such as the main villain Xavier having an assistant that was transformed into an anthropomorphic aardvark by a magic spell in the first episode. 
So despite Weissman's ambitions, when he first pitched the show to Eisner, Eisner chose to pass on it. Gargoyles was a riskier venture for the company considering how much of a huge jump it was from its other programming. It wasn't based on a toy line or feature film, so there wasn't already an established audience to work off of, and it was skewing towards an older audience than its predecessors on the block. Two things that could have been an issue for the show if not done right. But the people at Disney TV Animation thought Weissman was onto something. There was just a missing element to bring it together. Funny enough, it was actually another Disney property that had the answer. Because with the film Beauty and the Beast being the biggest film out for Disney at the time, the idea of having a beauty along with a beast as the leads was already floating around, which Tad Stone, the creator of Darkwing Duck, suggested Weissman use for gargoyles, which proved to be the final piece of the puzzle, as the framing of the whole show around this new, larger gargoyle Goliath, and their romance with a human detective named Elisa, was when everything that would be seen in the final product started to line up, and with it, a new generation of monster-loving degenerates was born. So after two years of development, another failed pitch, and further retooling, Eisner finally bought Weiss's pitch and greenlit the show but still being apprehensive of the project, only gave Weissman and his team a 13 episode first season compared to the usual 50 episodes they would typically order, meaning Gargoyle still had to prove itself. So what did Weissman do with this opportunity? Well, He and his production team made one of the best cartoons Disney has ever produced. Right from the start, Gargoyles was different from other cartoons at the time, debuting with a five-part story arc that ran every day for an entire week, which would later be compiled into a direct-to-video movie, along with a VCR board game, which is possibly the most 90 sentence I've ever said without mentioning Tamagotchis. I'm afraid I can't allow you to stop Xanatos. The success of his plan directly affects mine, so the player who just spun must go back six spaces. These first five episodes were used for extensive character and world building, because compared to DuckTales and Goof Troop, which were episodic comedy adventures that established themselves in a single episode, Gargoyles was built on extensive lore, creating multiple interconnected storylines with ongoing character arcs to the show playing out more like a serial than an after-school cartoon, especially as the series continued. The pacing was slow and methodical, taking its time to establish a tone and setting. Much of the main cast weren't even named for the first few episodes because gargoyles are established as not keeping to human naming conventions. Structurally speaking, gargoyles was much closer to the way comics played out over any cartoon. And if that wasn't already clear, just compare how Gargoyles is structured to Weissman's other series, Young Justice. Both use narratively standalone episodes that are loosely tied together to make a much larger framework of a story. You know, that structure everyone gives a lot of credit to Adventure Time for? Yeah. Snarky comments aside, the other thing that made Gargoyles really stand out is that it was heavy. There was tragedy, pathos, and a heavy emphasis in Shakespeare and Celtic myth. It was a series that tackled adult subject matter in a way younger audiences could easily digest, mostly by respecting their intelligence. In one of the series' more controversial yet most remembered episodes, Brooklyn ended up hurting Elisa after playing around with her gun, and it doesn't shy away from the seriousness of the topic either, with Elisa spending the majority of the episode in critical condition. But above all else, the central theme of the first season was the gargoyles looking for their place in the world and people that would accept them for who they were, something a lot of kids and teenagers could probably relate to. These were characters with nuanced personalities and morals, and this applied to the villains just as well, as their motives weren't simply evil for evil's sake. Xanatos was a clever entrepreneur that was always working out strategies so that he would always come out winning in the end even when he appears to lose, but gradually grows into a more sympathetic person as he finds things to care about. Demona, after dealing with over a century's worth of prejudice, hates humans for what they did to her kind and wants to show Goliath the truth of the world. And Coldstone was a revived mechanical gargoyle going through their own identity crisis. Though like any Shakespearean play, it wasn't just the writing, it was how it was spoken, 
because the voice cast that was hired for Gargoyles was top-notch. Keith David was the perfect casting for Goliath, giving the character this powerful, booming voice that screams leader. I've been denied everything, even my revenge! Okay, between making Goliath look like Fabio crossed with a bat and giving him a voice like this, I'm certain Disney and Weissman knew exactly what they were doing to their audience. But it wasn't just Keith David carrying the voice acting. There was Sally Richardson as Lisa, Marina Sirtis as Demona, John Reese davies as the antagonist Macbeth, and professional interrogator Jonathan Frakes as Xanatos. How much money would it take to make you spend a night in a cemetery? You know the answer to that, Owen. Pay a man enough, and he'll walk barefoot into hell. Then there was the animation, which even by today's standards, 20 years later, is beautiful, both in its use of color and its composition, especially in the first five pilot episodes, where money seemed to have been thrown at the project. There are some shots that I've used a couple times in this video simply because they're so visually striking, like Goliath screaming into the night sky with the moon frame behind him. What really sells the look is the use of painted backgrounds, as they work extremely well for the style the show is going for, utilizing a lot of dark blue and grey tones to give it a broodier feeling, and makes the sunrises really pop, which was important since they had a narrative weight, being that was when the gargoyles are forced to sleep adding a sort of ticking clock to everything, so it needed to be visually clear by the lighting and shading, how close they were, and when that shift would happen. Also, as an aside, whoever on the art team came up with the idea of having the gargoyles' wings wrap around their bodies and clasping at the front to become a cloak was a goddamn genius, as it gave their designs, specifically Goliaths, a calmer, human-like shadow when the story's tone required it distinguishing them from their animalistic design and leaning into a more superhero aesthetic, something that was likely influenced by Batman. And it wasn't just the visuals that took inspiration from Batman either, because Gargoyles clearly used the show as an example or template for its direction, with the majority of season 1 being written by husband and wife team Michael and Brianne Chandler Reeves, who came from writing on Batman the Animated Series. On the subject, Weissman himself said, we weren't trying to emulate Batman, but certainly that darker, dramatic tone that Batman had let us know that there was an audience for this style of action drama at a high quality level. Sadly, Bruce Timm, lead creator on Batman the Animated Series, didn't share the same level of artistic respect to Gargoyles at the time, saying the whole premise of the show was kinda namby-pamby anyway, with all that Celtic fantasy crap. Like, come on Tim. I know you made one of the best cartoons of the 20th century, but really, do you gotta be like that? Regardless of certain perceptions though, Gargoyles definitely stood on its own as it went on, from the way it handled its characters to how it structured its stories, and the first season of the series was a massive hit because of it. However, while this was a huge victory for Weissman and his team, the show's early success may have also built it up to fail. Stay tuned, the Disney Afternoon will return. So after seeing the initial success of its first season, Eisner went from being skeptical of Gargoyles to one of its most avid supporters, going so far as deciding the series would be the pillar of a new action-focused universe within Disney that could compete with Marvel and DC, and went ahead with greenlighting a 52-episode second season. But while it was great that the series finally had the complete support of the CEO, this was also a problem, because the staff on Gargoyles was given a 10 month production cycle just like they were with the first season. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this type of 52 episode production was common for Disney's other cartoons, but as established, Gargoyles was a fundamentally different product. So despite expanding on the writing and animation staff to help, asking for 4 times the amount of episodes and expecting the same level of quality as the first season was pushing it which inevitably led to production issues, such as having to recycle a lot of music and sound effects from the previous season, with very few new scores added in, and often using the same impact sound for every type of material. Weissman has even stated that the recaps at the start of episodes in this season were less about reminding the audience of characters and plot details, but was a way to cut out 30 seconds or so of bad animation that they would get from the Japanese or Korean studios that they'd contracted out to. 
Outside of the production issues though, now having the backing of Eisner, season 2 was where the writers and other creative staff could really spread their wings so to speak and go even further in depth with the stories they wanted to tell now that the basic premise was established after the first season, becoming more and more like a magic Shakespearean soap opera as it progressed. Xanatos and leader of the pack Fox are revealed to be in a relationship, eventually getting married, having a kid, and being visited by Fox's mother Titania, Queen of the Fairies. Elisa's brother gets transformed into a mutant furry, and then forms his own clan after turning on Xanatos. Coldstone develop multiple personalities, which are in a love triangle with each other. The main cast gained a roster of evil genetic clones, all named after cities in Los Angeles, which is fitting. And that's all without getting into the time travel and mythological beings. But while it might sound like I'm being cheeky about these premises, these are all great storylines that expanded on the world and characters. Take the backstory between Demona and Macbeth, something that was hinted at in the previous season, but wasn't detailed until the four-part story arc, City of Stone. Using Shakespeare's Macbeth as a vague jumping off point, the four episodes shows the years Demona struggled to survive after Goliath and the rest were cursed, and the Alliance turned a millennia-long 1v1 deathmatch that she developed with the real Macbeth. By the end of it all, it starts to make sense why Demona has such a strong resentment and hatred towards humans, and how scorned she felt having Goliath choose them over her. She spent a thousand years fighting for her life, and when she's finally reunited with her love, he chooses to side with her enemies. The story doesn't just blame the society she lived in though, because it makes a point of calling into question Demona's part in everything that happened, as Demona's thirst for vengeance only perpetuated further harm, creating a never-ending cycle while she maintained her own victim complex. I'm repeating myself here, but that's some sophisticated morality for a show airing on Disney at 4pm on a Thursday afternoon. But easily the biggest change up to the story in season 2 was halfway through, when Goliath, Elisa, and Bronx were taken to the island of Avalon from Arthurian legend, where they had to fight a time traveling wizard and the three weird sisters along with King Arthur. Sure, it sounds ridiculous when it's said out loud. This was then followed by a 20 episode arc where the group, along with Goliath's long lost daughter, traveled across the world as Avalon magically transported them to places where they could help, thus leading to a tour of multiple nations and their unique gargoyles and mythologies. Now this is just my assumption here, but this world tour arc was more than likely done as a way to pad out the 52 episode production request because having to create multiple interconnected storylines across that many episodes in 10 months would be a major challenge. So this arc was used as a way to pad it out since most of these episodes are entirely self removed from the rest, feeling more like filler by comparison, and were pretty hit or miss as they went on. In one episode, a man tries to capture the Egyptian death god Anubis in order to force him to bring back his dead son, only having to accept he has to let his son rest in peace in the end as death isn't something you can bargain with. This was Gargoyles at its best, addressing tougher concepts like grief, acceptance, and the necessity and inevitability of death. Also, having Tony J voice Anubis was just a fantastic pick. I grant but one boon, mortal, and it will be given to you as it is given to everyone when your time has come. But then there were episodes that felt like they were really stretching for a premise like the group visiting Easter Island, and learning that the famous head statues were modeled after an alien who resided there protecting Earth from an extraterrestrial invasion from eons ago. Now, I'm apprehensive of saying this arc was explicitly terrible, it's just that the episode quality was constantly fluctuating over this entire storyline, especially for how long it lasted, which might have been to the show's detriment in the long run. While Gargoyle still maintained a strong audience, Disney in general began to view the show's second season as a disappointment, hoping to see it outperform shows like Power Rangers airing at the same time, which was asking a lot considering Power Rangers was easily the most viewed kids programming of that year. What didn't help though was that Gargoyles was also airing during the infamous OJ Simpson trials, causing what should have been 4 weeks of the world tour to become 6 months due to being regularly bumped for trial coverage making the entire thing feel like it lasted way too long, which started to hurt viewership with those that wanted to return to adventures in New York City with the entire clan. 
Programming issues notwithstanding, Gargoyles not quite reaching those high expectations could have been glanced over since it was still quite well received overall and did decent ratings, but Disney was also dealing with massive shakeups within its higher ups, and all of Gargoyles' firm supporters in the company, like Jeffrey Katzenberg and Gary Crystal, had left for DreamWorks, and Eisner was no longer in control of the animation division due to criticisms that he micromanaged too much, meaning no one was around to fight for the show outside of Weissman and Gargoyles was in danger of being scrapped entirely. But since the show still had some worth to it, the Disney execs in charge gave Gargoyles one more shot. Though in hindsight, they just as well were setting it up to fail. And this brings us to the point that a lot of longtime Gargoyles fans watching likely have been anticipating. Like one gets excited for a root canal, because now we get to the infamous third season, titled The Goliath Chronicles. Which is just… okay. It's not god-awful necessarily, it's just simply… alright. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But that's also the problem. After following up the previous two seasons, even with their shortcomings, just alright is a steep step down. But let's back up a bit. So after the previous season failed to meet Disney's expectations, and a limitation on resources and time, it was decided by Disney management to allocate Gargoyles from primarily Disney's in-house TV animation studio to the Canadian studio Nelvan in favor of series they felt would perform better, which would be the first of many death nails in the show's coffin. To start, in general the animation simply became a lot more stiff, losing the bounce and vibrancy that the series originally had. The one episode where that type of animation could be seen again was in the episode Seeing Isn't Believing which was actually outsourced to Disney Animation Australia, but it had its own inconsistencies, with Elisa being given facial features closer to Jasmine from Aladdin and a sexy swagger to her walk, which I'm not entirely against per se, but this wasn't consistent with her design or character. Even by the animator's own account, they were given zero time to familiarize themselves with the characters since it was treated as a filler project, so they basically did what they wanted which shows how very little concern Disney had for the show at that point. And while it would be impossible to expect the show to have the animation quality it had at the very start, after Disney reallocated the series due to not wanting to spend more money on it, there are fundamental animation fumbles that are harder to excuse. Like this gun that Goliath's clone Thalog is holding in an episode suddenly appearing to be the same perspective size when held by Dr. Cerverius' mutant clone, who is three times larger. I mean, what are we to believe this is some sort of magic gun? Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. To make matters worse, on top of the animation studio change, Gargoyles was also moved from the syndicated Disney Afternoon over to the newly bought ABC network in order to bolster its Saturday morning programming, which meant it was exclusively airing on that network. So viewers used to watching it on specific affiliates would have missed it if they weren't aware of the change. Gargoyles being exclusive to ABC's network also meant that the writing team had to follow stricter standard and practice rules than it was when it was syndicated, which started to create issues. So while the show was fortunate enough to keep its voice actors, most of its creative staff, from the writers to producers, did not stay, either due to creative restrictions or being outright replaced. Weissman was even changed from a series producer to story editor only which eventually just became a creative consultant role which he chose not to be credited for, as he felt he only advised against decisions rather than actually adding anything, leading us to the biggest failing of this season, the writing itself. Where the earlier seasons subtly and maturely addressed that prejudice and mistrust based on superficial ideas simply leads to further hatred and violence, only perpetuating a cycle that never stops, season 3 jumps right to and I don't know any other way to phrase this, Gargoyles KKK. And it's not as if there wasn't a racial subtext this series before, because there very much was, but this season's writing takes that subtext and pushes it to clear, bright neon text. I know writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. And what makes this frustrating is that there were interesting concepts to the stories in this season. Now that Gargoyles were common knowledge to the people after the finale of the last season, there were intriguing avenues to go, like with Goliath's trial. Originally, it was supposed to be to deliberate on the gargoyle sentience, questioning if the gargoyles counted as humans or animals and where they fell in regards to the law. That's a point that would have been great to see addressed. But then it became gargoyle court, 
where Goliath has to prove he didn't commit a robbery. And this goes into a larger issue for this season, where the episodes became much more isolated, with little connection to the rest of the series or each other, which made everything feel like they had substantially less stakes compared to the previous seasons, despite their being set up for a strong storyline where the gargoyles have to find their place in a city that actively hates them. Frankly, between the heavy-handed bigotry subtext and a lack of any real stakes, the Goliath Chronicles became a much less enjoyable X-Men cartoon than Gargoyles, which is probably due to the fact that a large majority of the writing staff on this new season came from X-Men the Animated Series. Now, this isn't saying the X-Men series is bad, I have plenty of nostalgia for it, but it's clear that the writing team were working from what they knew as they had very little time to actually familiarize themselves with the first two seasons of Gargoyles and all its lore, which is why a lot of the established ideas and characters were entirely forgotten or neglected, especially anything coming from season two. So despite having a good opening setup for interesting storylines, the Goliath Chronicles failed to meet the high expectations of the series, and due to both the show being moved from weekday afternoons to Saturday mornings on a single channel, and the overall drop in quality, the ratings for the Goliath Chronicles tanked, resulting in Disney choosing not to renew it. Season 3, by most accounts, just didn't need to exist, from the creators deeming it non-canon to Disney only releasing the first two seasons on DVD years later. So that's the end of it? A sad, limp ending to a show so iconic and innovative? Well, not entirely. While the series ended in 1997, it lasted a lot longer than that, simply because the fans and the creators wouldn't let it die. Outside of North America, Gargoyle still regularly airs, even if just reruns, on Disney channels in countries like Italy, Serbia, and the United Kingdom. Then there's Weissman himself, who years after leaving the company, pushed Disney to allow him and a team to produce a couple 12-issue comic runs, one of which continued off where he personally left the series thus retroactively making his own new canon for fans that didn't like how the show ended. And of course, it wouldn't be a Disney property without merchandising deals long after they stopped actually caring about it. But one of the most astounding pushes to keep the series alive was the Gathering of the Gargoyles, an annual Gargoyles convention, which started in June 1997, shortly after the final season ended. This was a convention created, funded, and ran by the Gargoyles fandom, for those who just wanted to be around other fans of a similar interest, showing off art, cosplay, and radio plays based on the series, and inviting those involved in the show for panels and signings. At first it started as a simple small time con, only having Greg Weissman and Keith David as guests, but over the years it became a sizable convention with upwards of 50 guests and multiple events, before it ended in 2009 due to funding issues and creative conflicts with those involved. Regardless of how it ended though, conventions aren't something easily put together, nor are they ever really profitable. So these gatherings were clearly a labor of love by the people who organized them, and just shows how much love they had for three seasons of a cartoon. You don't spend over 10 years organizing an event across multiple cities without a deep passion for it. This animated show about gargoyles adventuring around New York City despite existing in relative obscurity outside of millennials like myself after it stopped airing, had a major impact on a lot of people, and fostered a sizable fan community that thrived long after it went off the air, which speaks to just how strongly media can affect and shape us. Whether it's Gargoyles, Reboot, Kirby, Sixteen, Pokemon, or My Little Pony, everyone has that one series that they hold deeply for whatever reason. And maybe, just maybe, with the reboots of older cartoons of Disney's like DuckTales seeing huge success, and a growing appreciation for longer form narratives in western animation, we might just see the Gargoyles revisited in an era where it would get a better shot than it did. But until then, they'll just have to keep sleeping. <laughs>